Welcome to Model Steam Engine's Top Tip Time. This one is part 13. In many of my videos, I feature specific parts containing very useful tips. Some of these top tips are obvious, but some of them are actually less obvious and a little bit more subtle. This series features a constant flow of very useful top tips. And here I'm working on a Stuart Models beam engine, which did need a lot of attention. Starting off with the cylinder base, a viewer sent me a message and said I should really use a felt tip pen to get rid of the white part of the gasket. And although this is not strictly necessary because very quickly oil gets in there and turns it black anyway, I thought I would take his comment on board and use the felt tip pen to remove the white edge of the gasket. And that's what I'm doing at the moment. When I fit this gasket, I'm not going to use any gasket sealant of any kind. The cylinder base is designed to be secured to the cylinder using four countersunk bolts. I didn't have any 5BA steel countersunk bolts, so here I'm using brass ones. I chopped the brass bolts to the correct length using a pair of side cutters, then I cleaned up the ends of the four bolts using my 1 inch belt sander, and here I'm screwing them in place. Really these should be steel bolts, but as I've just said, I don't have any of those in 5BA sizes. The main benefit of using brass bolts instead of steel bolts is they aren't going to go rusty. In this clip I'm making sure that every one of the bolts is of equal tightness. Whenever you lubricate a piston rod, the oil always runs all over the top of the gland. And when the oil is not contacting both the gland and the piston rod, it's not doing much in the way of lubrication. So it's a good idea to create a small reservoir in the top of the gland. All you do is put the gland nut in the lathe and drill the centre part of the way through using a larger drill. And now as you can clearly see there is a reservoir all the way around the piston rod. And this will hold a small amount of oil which is always in contact with the piston rod and the gland nut itself. Now there will be lubrication between the piston rod and the gland nut at all times. I'm applying some steam oil to the piston rod and as you can see it runs down the piston rod and will eventually sit in the recess that I've drilled in the top of the gland. If I remember rightly when I've worked on Stuart major beam engines this facility of a reservoir around the piston rod is cast in to the top of the gland. The threads in the main column are stripped. I'm going to have to do something about this. I don't like bodging anything. I could just fit the bolt with some Loctite but that's not the answer. The answer is to drill the hole a lot deeper and re-thread the hole a lot deeper. It's time to mount the column and I'm going to use some washers just to demonstrate how horrible they look. It's a matter of personal taste and this is my opinion. I do not like using washers for mounting things like columns onto the bed plate. I don't like the look of these washers anyway, they're too big. And unfortunately I don't have any 2BA washers that are smaller than this. I suppose I could make some, but really I just like the effect of a nut directly against the paint. Because I used etching primer, the paint is well stuck to the etching primer, and the etching primer in turn is very well bonded to the metal. I'm sure lots of viewers with no content on their own YouTube channel will write in and tell me how to do the job. Yes, the nut's going to mark the paint, but the marks around the nut in the top left of this image were made by the washer. Once these bolts are covered in oil, which there will be to stop them rusting, everything will look fine. In these highly magnified images, every discrepancy, every tiny little mark and fingerprint shows up. But when I look at the parts, without using a camera, they look fine. In a normal steam engine, the crankshaft alignment is possibly the most vital thing. But with a beam engine, you have the added problem of the beam. And here we have the beam. There is no way of fastening the beam to the cross shaft. It just pushes in there and the beam is free to wobble about. This is not good engineering practice. So what I'm going to do is drill a hole in the beam. And I've already shown that at one side of the beam, there's a thicker part to allow this to happen. I don't have a drawing for this engine. I'm just guessing that that's what that part's for. After making a mark on the beam using a Sharpie felt tip pen, First of all, I drilled it with a centre drill part way down, then all the way through, using a twist drill that is tapping size for a 6BA thread, which I think was 2.3mm. I actually used a number drill, and I can't remember the number of it. 
Either way, the hole in the beam is the correct size to allow me to thread it using a 6BA tap. And now it's been threaded, I'm withdrawing the tap, and it's time to put a groove screw in there. When tapping holes in components like this, you really have to be careful. Even if you don't break off the tap as it goes into the hole, sometimes you can break it off as you withdraw it from the hole, and it definitely breaks off if you drop the entire assembly on the floor. And yes, I've done that as well. Time now to clean up the beam. First of all, I'm removing the Sharpie felt tip pen mark with some Scotch Brite. And in this clip, I'm using some wet or dry sandpaper to clean up the edge of the beam where I caught it with the paintbrush. In this clip, I'm sliding the cross shaft in place. Now, where did I put my Allen key? Aha, here it is. I'm tightening the grub screw in place, and you notice it's a very long grub screw. It doesn't need to be this long, it's just one I had in a box of very long grub screws. And here is a shot of the completed beam. This is the top of the beam, so obviously you can't see the grub screw. Time now, without further ado, to reassemble the bearings. These bearings are not quite the same as the ones I normally come across. Usual steam engine bearings are split entirely, including the bearing itself. And this allows for adjustment with the bearing in situ, without removing anything, other than the top cap and the top part of the bearing. On a model steam engine though, it's just as easy to replace the entire bearing when it wears. I need to make sure that these bearings are clamped in place firmly. And by using a 6BA brass bolt in the oil hole in the centre and a small hammer, I can gently tap the top bearing cap in place. Here are the main top bearings for the beam. I fitted the oil cups into the centre hole and the entire top caps are held to the bottom part using 6BA hexagon bolts. In this clip I'm cleaning up the faces of the bearing bushes because I got some paint on them and they just look a bit better cleaned up. Now the machining operation has finished, I'm cleaning off any tool marks on the tops of the pieces of metal. And doing this using your hand on a piece of sandpaper makes your fingers very sore after a while. I'm using a telescopic magnet. Being a magnet it sticks to the piece of steel and by holding it by the magnet, I can now rub the piece of steel up and down this piece of emery cloth for as long as I like without making my fingers sore. These days, there are some really good magnets available. The best ones to use are the neodymium type. Once they're stuck to a piece of steel, they're quite hard to remove. Here's a shot of the first metal plate, suitably thinned, mounted on top of the column. Only loosely mounted, but mounted nevertheless. And here, I'm bolting the second piece of metal in place. The next part of the job was to quickly spray the top part of the column. Now try to contain your excitement as I stir the paint. This is Great Western Railway's green paint. And to be completely precise so I don't get lots of questions, this is pre-1945 GWR Railway paint. The good thing about this paint, apart from it being from a company called Phoenix Paints, and to give the tin of paint its full title, Phoenix Precision Paints. This is really good paint. You paint it on, not too thick and not too thin, and then once you leave it, all the brush marks disappear. It's beautiful stuff to use. And once the paint's dried and hardened, it's very durable. I've painted a lot of models over the years using this stuff, and it's really good. Often I've used green, but occasionally I'll use Crimson Lake. But that's it for now, and here's the usual gratuitous shot of the paint drying. Thanks for watching, and I hope you found it useful. Please take the time to visit my Main Steam Models website. Click on the section of the website that says Video Playlists. And by doing that, you will find it very easy to find other videos that you may like to watch.